We really admire the way they have chosen to approach uh, the crisis of addiction and perception of drug usage through this project and their open-ended kind of embrace of all its facets. So I don't want to, I would love for you guys to um, tell us what you are thinking about and how you would like to introduce Infernal Grove aside from your videos. Um, uh, first, I just want to say thank you because that was incredibly nice. <laughs> and, uh, and I uh, really appreciate words of affirmation. <laughs> so I, yeah, just, I really, uh, for us, similarly, it just feels like um, I often don't have a sense of comrades, you know, um, I, I often feel like I um, get to the bottom of a person and uh, or to the middle anyway, and kind of I'm like, oh, God, we don't have like the same values. <laughs> and I just feel like your values are manifest in your work. And I really appreciate it. Oh, and the other thing is, Liz, I'm sorry I told you that you had to do a personal introduction. I realized immediately afterwards that that is a very, very tall order. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, but that was, you, you really knocked it out of the park. <laughs> um, do you want to? So talk? let's introduce the, the prod, the yeah. internal growth. Okay, so yeah, you guys just saw um, two videos. You saw a 20 minute chunk of pieces that are part of the infernal growth. And you saw um, a 10 minute excerpt from You Were in Amazement, a piece that we made in 2019. Um, the Infernal Grove was started in 2020, but ideally it's an ongoing video that changes and morphs over time. At this point, we haven't actually edited the video it's substantially in quite a while, but we have a huge amount of footage that we're about to get in. <laughs> which, um, yeah, which is, I mean, uh, it's been a really interesting project for us as. Um, as artists, <laughs> because so the Infernal Grove, kind of like in a nutshell, it's really a sprawl. It's an intentionally sprawling project that does exactly what you said, Liz. Like it's about the pleasure of interrogating something through both a material lens and through a kind of like very broad, uh, openness to, to like, you know, we, we had dinner with a woman when we were in New York for a screening by two of the Infernal Grove participants, regular participants, um, Liz Roberts and Devin Noreen Singh, who are also both amazing filmmakers. And uh, I really, I don't want to tell tales out of school at all, but I think Liz is making a feature from her uh, short that we screened then. Um, and uh, why am I talking about, oh, why am I talking about? Them going to New York. Um, anyway, I'm just going to take a step back because that happens to me all the time, by the way, that I forget halfway through. Um, but yeah, so it's a set of uh, kind of interactive events, by which I mean basically stuff like this, but um, where everybody's on the Zoom and there is kind of like um, very open and broad range conversation. So we, yeah, I guess if we want to go to details, we've done three different types of events. Um, study groups where we have a reading and then a discussion and um, user groups where we have just discussion. It's a little more like an AA meeting. And one of the things that got, made me kind of interested in thinking that this could be a way to like create a space that doesn't really exist as far as I know, is to have a space where we can have the spectrum of people in the same room, having a conversation about their relationship to drugs and alcohol and the relationship that drugs and alcohol have on society broadly. Um, yeah. 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 And just have those conversations be loose and open with all the people who want to participate. And so Emily and I have been, um, well, we can talk about our history. With drugs. Our, we'll do another question. Um, yeah, we could just, of course, go like on and on and on. Uh, but I think that the kind of if you're thinking about it in like very broken down terms, the Infernal Grove is a movie. Um, uh, these study groups and stuff, screening series, et cetera, like active stuff with other people who have lived experience of drug use. Um, and uh, there are there's such a range of people in that group. And that like is. I would say if it hadn't, 
like the thing that's kind of astonishing is like I sought Liz out. Liz is very like, how can I describe it? She has an aura like uh, Merlena Dietrich or something. So I'm always like, Liz, Liz, do you like me? <laughs> and uh, I don't know if she likes me. But Devin and Makiki, who are two also people who um, are involved, they have virtually, well, especially in Devin's opinion, diametrically opposed uh feelings about sobriety like Devin is in relatively early sobriety and he's really struggling and Makiki like has been through that grind I think a lot and has a way more um I kind of feel like in a certain way the people who have participated in in Infernal Grove can be divided into like people who like the constraints you know, for whom that constraint really works as a method. And then people like me who are just like, I am not going to have a constraint. If you try to put a constraint. (laughs) And so our way of being sober is that we're sober like most of the time. (laughs) And sometimes we use drugs and alcohol and sometimes using drugs is fun. Using alcohol is never fun for us now. Yeah. Yeah. No, you should do it on your machine. Um, one thing I really appreciate about so, if you've never seen Infernal Grove, and you can find out more about them by following them on Instagram, uh, that's how we found out about it. They can tell us also where you guys can find out. But one thing that I really appreciate about it is the way that it sort of. Um, embraces a lot of viewpoints, and I think you can see that in the film, um, especially how they don't shy away from talking about the different experiences of racism through drugs, um, and how that sort of um, openness to feedback is part of the structure of infernal growth, where there's readings and then um, people present. Well, and also in the, you know, it must be close to a year since we discovered Infernal Grove, and I still don't know what it is, and I don't think I probably ever will, which is fantastic. Um, but I think, you know, I'm just astounded by watching these videos and then trying to understand how they relate to Simple Twilight, and we, uh, we had the experience of you guys accidentally sending an early cut of Simple Twilight, um, and it's really interesting to see that and then see the final product and kind of look at sort of the product piece and see how the process works um, and see how you've gone, I think, from text to voiceover. Um, so that was really interesting. But what I wanted to mention is, uh, as I was watching the video just now, I was thinking about Cop City and what happened in Atlanta. Um, made a little vigil for it last night and then reflecting on it, I just kept thinking, like, we all are kind of on the precipice of seeing this like relationship, you know, the relationship between, you know, carceral structures and addiction and all of it, it's sort of like, it's on the tip of all of our tongues. And you guys have already kind of thrown yourself into it kind of without constraint in this way, that's very sort of maximalist, but also has these moments of incredible clarity and lucidity. So I feel like you're kind of forerunners in a sense and sort of like what's happening. Um, so I wonder if you can kind of speak to that sense of, you know, we're all trying to pull together, you know, all of these different pieces about ecology and racism and addiction and et cetera. And I think I'm so inspired by what you're doing. And I'm just kind of curious your reflections on, on that. Um, the, I, I'm curious that you saw an progress cut of the infertile girl. I don't think anyone saw any progress. We'll hear that story later. <laughs> Huh? Um, Simple Twilight. Um, Did we just say? That's so great. Uh, Thank you for like watching them both. It's really uh, so, you know, like all for all of us who make experimental media, it's very rewarding. (laughs) But anybody watches to work closely. One of the things I think that we the kind of phrases that we used a lot when we were first starting this project that I, I think still holds, but we haven't said it as much, is that we want to talk about drugs and alcohol and their relationship broadly because it's interesting. And we want to talk about the parts that we think are interesting and let other people kind of talk about the parts that they think are interesting. 
and try to hear all of what people have to say about it. Um, ideally in a conversation, but you know, that conversation will also take place kind of between events. I also, I want to want to kind of uh, pick up on the stuff about the relationship between say the carceral and um, uh, the climate crisis or whatever, you know, like the death of all <laughs> that is coming. Um, uh, it's, been a really challenging connection. It's probably been the most challenging connection for people to make when they engage with Infernal Grove, uh, like especially the the moving image stuff. Uh, is it's people find it hard to connect the like the nature stuff to the addiction stuff and the kind of more, um, I guess, you know, more material. Like the to be like j- stupid about it. It's like the the nature footage is borrowing from object oriented ontology which of course is just animism for white people um but uh so yeah that is like the object oriented ontology stuff and then you know about like about expanding understanding of like being self uh whatever subjectivity and then the other part is like pointing to a more uh, kind of like historically rooted, um, maybe more like explicitly Marxist stuff, you know? Or, yeah, or a, a, at least analytical, like the stuff that is the 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 footage that we're shooting um, is like intentionally kind of not analytical. We're not trying to make a comment on anything specific. We're trying to make each shot as interesting as we can to us at the time. And there may be things added to shots, like we have juxtapositions of whatever, you know, a, a bird's wing with live, with live birds sitting on the bird's wing. That is really intense, um, that footage, actually. Yeah, it's or like other that. shots with drug paraphernalia, but also a bird feeder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, there was the, there's the one, I think you guys saw it, where where the, the bird seed gets cut up into lines. Did that one play? I yeah. love it. that's like one of my favorite moments. Although the, the footage is not great. It's but it's uh it's like so yes, those that stuff that is about like yeah, like being fucked up, but on <laughs> I just get high on birds. I mean, like fuck off, Emily. That's so appalling. Um, I just love the land. Of course, there are very dangerous illusions that come with any conversation about nature, especially one that idealizes. But fuck that. I, that's about the, like beauty and the just like, I need it and it healed me. And I know how corny that is. And when people kind of just can like read that and, and then I feel so good. Um, and people have, you know, like Ellery, uh, Bryant, who's in the group with us, who I really, who's amazing. She really gets that. They really get that. And it's really, wow, what an asshole for getting their pronouns wrong <laughs> on a recording. Yeah. Do you have more? Well, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it's funny because when you mentioned I'm an ontology, we actually did, we did a panel with Graham Harmon last year. Um, and it's really striking to me because they try to turn the aesthetic into an analytic, you know, and you then on the one hand are inspired by that, but then you're willfully just throwing yourself into the aesthetic. Um, I find it really exciting. Um, I also love, is it the cedar wax wings who were found um, with liver damage? Here? I found that so profound. Um, there's a book about psych- it's sort of a very romantic book about psychedelia, you know, that kind of looks at how all different kinds of flies and lizards and things are known to use various kinds of pentagens or um, things, and it's very glorified. But I sort of love the idea, actually, of kind of destruct- destructive and addictive process sort of actually being natural. And so you, what you do with that, I've never really seen anyone do. I found it really intriguing um, that you kind of find, actually, in nature, um, as it were, something that in the social realm we see as pathology. Um, it really kind of excited me, sort of a... Uh, some weird version of narcissism that I'm very cool. We had a question about time lapse. Yeah, I was just wondering when you started. I mean, the the connection between altered states and time lapse is in a way so obvious, but so lush and so beautiful. 
And, um, but also, I mean, I haven't really seen anyone do it the way that you do it or use it the way that you do it. And I really appreciate that. Actually, I think in your whole body of work that I've seen, there are so many sort of um, turns that uh, seem to be be very contemporary and very media savvy, but I've never seen people kind of use it the way that you do to craft this narrative structure. So I think that's very interesting. Yes, to you. I have to put a little more thing on that, which is that we have had your video playing in the gallery for you know, a month now, I, but I still enjoy it. And it took me forever to figure out that the horn riff came from Justin Bieber. Is that right? Yes, yeah. but it's not really. It's Diplo. Okay. Justin Bieber can sing. Sorry. <laughs> Um, but you know, I'm going to be very media savvy when I heard Billie Eilish, I think, today. Is that right? Um, I found that really intriguing. So. There's Billie yeah. Eilish, then there's also the, uh, I don't think this played, or maybe it did, uh, the Olivia Rodrigo song that, uh, like, where's my fucking teenage dream? I love that song. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we love all um, the songs. Well, yeah, with pop music, the, with that Bieber song, we did something that I that I am always like happy to do, which is use pop music, but use a version that's just ripped from YouTube of someone like playing it on their keyboard, you know, or some like uh, kind of live performance that is an inadequate substitute, but has a lot more character and is more complicated and interesting because of that. Because of the, I really appreciated it, Liz, that you say like. One of the things about the time lapse is that it's obvious, you know, mm-hmm. time lapse is obvious. So is uh, so is a certain kind of use of music. And, you know, it like I think Civil Twilight is really interesting for us. I mean, I'm going to talk about our work now and I always worry that that's boring. But you were an amazement uh, was made before Civil Twilight and you were an amazement like fucking destroyed me to make it really just like it undid me and it kind of did me back up a little bit and uh then uh, but then i think we both were like fuck you know people didn't exactly respond to it in the in the art world because uh it's obvious you know like it's very sappy and you know she dies happy like i but i just did not care in that work but then we did feel like what? How did how did Civil Twilight come to be? Uh, we just wanted to do some Infernal yeah. Grove, or I mean, Your Amazement was like a years long project that was like really hard to have a narrative and keep it all together. And so we were like, we're going to make something that makes no sense, is quick and dirty, and we're going to do it in a couple weeks, and we're done. And yeah, you know, what? Well, yeah, it took like more time than that, but I think it's um it's a pretty tight little piece at this point. It is, but we made it like. We made it to kind of code switch from the very femme, uh, like, you were an amazement. Because I've always known that, like, if I repudiate femme, it's going to get me traction in the art world. Well, I don't, you're going to have to ask that question, but... um well, weird thing we did we were thinking about it. Do you know the Coons Therapy Young Girl? Who is it? Say again. Cocoon, the, there's a, a text, it's a semi text piece called Theory of a Young Girl. Uh-huh. Um, if, you're, if you're not already kind of working with that, it's probably not, not actually worth getting, getting so much into it. It reminds me a lot of what you're saying. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we. Yesterday we were talking a little bit and you, you really didn't like the illusion of someone like Maggie Nelson, but um, I think there's something interesting in the way that you mix a kind of speculative kind of fiction with a personal story and the way that you pull in these media bits about it, um, or these very mediated, like easily accessible touchstones to make something greater than the whole and that's how I see your work with time lapse also. I mean it's obvious but it's um so well done. And it also I mean I have this sort of feeling in kind of you know looking at your work um and following you, you know, being really curious about your relationship to the art world, you know, and kind of if that's changed and if there's sort of something going on throughout this body of work um that really speaks to that or if there, you know, 
have you had to change your relationship to the art world through this process? Um, the Infernal Grove certainly relates differently. Like with the Infernal Grove, I'm kind of like not concerned about it existing in the art world, except the um, we want to have an installation with it. So that piece we want in a gallery, in a museum, in a museum, yeah, in a, in a big space with a big budget to do it all perfect. Yeah, because um, yeah. inside but, beauty there is a room. That's yeah. what it's going to be called. Inside beauty there is a room, and that part of the show. And then you go in and it's a room, it's a room and it's not a dome, which we thought it would be, but, and it's just all this time-lapse footage, the stuff yeah. that you're seeing behind us, you know? Yeah. And the idea would be that we would have a, a circular room with this kind of footage playing. And then in the center of the circular room that is our round benches with enough space to seat like a dozen people. And then we would have the equivalent of the Infernal Grove meetings where we met inside that room and had a discussion. We'd probably get Danny Restack, uh, or formerly Danny Leventhal, to make the benches for us because she's made them before. And that was like the way that we started thinking about those benches as a, because you can sit, it's a circle. So you can sit facing each other or you can sit outside it and look at the uh, work. And that's like, that's perfect. I'm, I, I love that, you know? Um, but the fact, this is a, uh, I really want to get funding for the project. I just want money uh, to uh, make the installation, but also because, you know, we pay everybody. We never like, I wouldn't, I, I don't, I hope that we don't ask people to do uh, work without paying them and we don't pay handsomely, <laughs> but it's, it just like allows, it allows it to keep moving, you know, as a project. But yeah, the art world has a different relation. Yeah, I think that the, maybe the big change in relation to the art world, or it's something that's been kind of consistent, but has like solidified more in recent years is a feeling of like, I'm just going to do what I want. Like, I'm not going to like be trying to satisfy anything or trying to like go for something that I see other people doing and move in a certain direction. I'm going to do what, what kind of appeals to me in the short term and just kind of dig in on that. Which yeah, is, yeah, I agree with that. And I think that's partly a function of being old. It's partly a function of having uh, tenured jobs, having tenure. Um, it gives us just like so much security and then allows us. It does like it's a very fucked up uh, American institution, but it is also a great gig. You know, one of the poets who actually is in uh, she's. She's in Civil Twilight. You see her hands and she reads that poem, Oh, That Mouth, You Marvelous Delinquent Organ, which I don't know if that's made it into final cuts of it. I, it started to freak me out. Um, but she said, I don't know why people complain about it. Otherwise, I'd be working at Kmart. I was like, yeah, it's good to remember. <laughs> Do you... Um I mean, I think that's an interesting thing. Academia used to be a place where you could be fucked up and make work, and it would be a hell for that. So, is that something that you see changing through the infernal grave, or you see pressures there for artists who now? Because all of the like funding and stuff, this is also, you know, I'm just gonna be very candid. All of the funding is reliant on being able, especially at the university, to identify um, alignments with the strategic plan of the university. And like, I am very good at going through and finding the alignments because uh, we have an underserved population that we can talk about, you know? Like, it's really actually, it is quite, I feel like it's quite ugly the way that um, white people have been able to appropriate difference along a variety of axes. Have you seen this uh, thing circulating? Chat GPT wrote a strategic plan for university, and it's just it's just so fun. I mean, it's great. The, the new AI bot that we're playing with it. Uh, he cranked up this, uh, you know, strategic plan. It was just absolutely spot on. You know, it could have been any university in, in the North America. Um, Would you send that to us? 
Or maybe sure. what's it called? Chat. Chat GPT. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, speaking of appropriation, I, I asked it to do a land acknowledgement. Um, and it just spit out exactly what you'd expect, you know, in terms of just uh, uh, the most kind of uh, saccharine kind of, you know, unspirited, ungenuine kind of land acknowledgement. He's telling. I always think anodyne. <laughs> That's what that prose is. It's anodyne. Yeah. Uh, it's not even saccharine, you know? It doesn't even have that, like, you know, saccharine would come probably from, like, Probably from some like businesses, like yoga pants sellers. <laughs> but the university just wants to be anodyne. Um, I hate it very much and don't know what to do. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. How has your kind of relationships to altered states influenced your relationship to narrative structure? Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. I think our relationship to narrative structure um, comes from our influences when we were young. Yeah. Um, Alex Bag and Steve Ranke, and who make like quite short chunks of things. Episodic, and like that, you know. It was a it was a format that was like quick to quick to be able to crank stuff out, and it allowed us to do what I said earlier. I was just like you know, make something now, make something now and not have a large project with a complicated timeline and lots of people and lots of organization. Um, we've proven to be very poor at that. I think now that with the Infernal Grove, we're getting better with age, but like every kind of collaborative, large shoots enterprise oh, no. has just been a nightmare. A total failure, a total failure. We had the guy, one of the guys from The Wire, uh, like audition or record voiceover for us where you were in amazement. And not only was it unusable because it sounded saccharine, but I couldn't stay in the room while he was reading it because I found it so unbearable. And I just, and I was so embarrassed about the text, you know, and I just, so yeah, that's not our thing. So yes, quick and dirty. I asked this question, actually. I teach a video arts history class. And I ask them, you know, what is video art and why do people make it? And they're not necessarily inclined that way. Um, but one kid who is a video art student said, um, I like to make video art because it's cheaper and easier. <laughs> but I was like, that is <laughs> it's a healthy attitude. That was Deanne. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't answer oh, the narrative so right. question, which uh, I think. Do you have Go a ahead. shot? Um, the only the the a relationship that I see. Oh, I guess of course we do drugs in our early work, um, and in that work, I don't know. It stands for like kind of. I don't know. We have always like been happy to shock people just a little, you know. Um, but uh, I think that they both are formless, you know, like formlessness is a sought, a sought space for me in drugs. And uh, like when the pain becomes formless and amorphous and kind of shifts away a little. Um, but uh, also, also I, it's probably because I actually have a, like a fucked up brain that cannot sequence things like I really can't and also like can't tell left from right and so yeah it's it's frustrating especially for Cooper but thank <laughs> god I have Cooper I'm so lucky he puts software on my phone um <laughs> what do I do uh you sing and write and make movies and you do almost all the shooting these last two years or year anyways. Um, what? Five years. Oh, five I years. Okay. No, um, I don't know. But yeah. uh, the, oh, ah, fuck, you just said something I wanted to respond to. Um, was it something about your systems thinking? Oh yeah. It was the, um, the, the formlessness of drug use compared to the formlessness of our work. And I think the, the Emily is saying that's like a good thing. And I think it is in that 
whenever I want to really stop using some particular substance, usually it's because I've gotten to a point where there is none of that formlessness. Yeah. Like I know exactly, exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to go do X. It's yeah. going to be like this routine. It'll last. And I will feel bad. I feel good for this yeah. long, bad for this long. And I, if I really know what's going to happen, I repeat that you know, a thousand times. And I'm finally like, I can't do it anymore. Uh, no, I, I find the formlessness. I wrote uh, I, in like, I make, of course, like copious uh, lists of things I want to say about Infertile Grove. Um, and one is without drugs, I would never surprise myself again. But the exact moment a drug dies is when it doesn't surprise you anymore. And then the shame gets in. In the audience who has questions. Misha. Not right now. We'll ask again. Um, I'm having so much to take in. I and mean, the second you talk about formlessness, you're kind of right in the heart of some of the dialogues that led to this show, you know, and that have been ongoing. Um, and I know that we sent you a copy of the writings yet that go with the show, which we need to do. There's a, a great essay by John Clark, uh, this friend of ours who's a kind of anarchist philosopher. Um, but that's a good because of Taoism. Um, but formlessness, you know, it's for me, like I, I spent some time in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, and kind of did the Heart Sutra and talked about formlessness a lot. And but was also in the kind of Vajrayana lineage idea, you know, kind of the poison is also the antidote, which is something that, you know, seems like kind of works its way into the internal growth. And I find really exciting. And this whole, I, I, I really never heard him even say some of what you say about kind of. This means that enchantment also is within a sense being a cure to that pathological addiction. I find it very radical. One touchstone for me with that is, and I always say his name wrong, so correct me, David Bajarvitz. Lotion. What? Yeah, I'm going to say it wrong. It's not David Bajarvitz, but there's something. Put it in the chat, Matt. Put it in the chat if you can. Or Liz, if you want to do it, or whoever wants to do it, the things they can spell it. He was, uh, you know, the, the question really is getting, he, he was uh, an artist in New York in the late 80s, died of HIV, died of AIDS, and he was involved in ACTA. And so I wanted to ask actually about ACTA. Um, I kind of that didn't pay a lot of attention to them until I got really interested in Iboga. And I found out that there had actually been this kind of like part of ACTA that was actually serving Iboga, um, you know, to, to work with a opiate addiction. Um, and just kind of a long underground history of this and uh, really kind of blew my mind. Um, so I was mostly familiar with their work with, uh, you know, pushing for pharmaceuticals and things. But though in general, I'm, I'm kind of curious if ACT UP is an inspiration and a place you've explored, um, if it's something that you would align with the internal growth, like that kind of direct action around care. Yes. They are like fucking heroic, you know? And recently I have been reading and hearing about them. I listen to podcasts. Um, I heard a really interesting podcast about, I mean, who thought I would be interested in this? Usually I hate stuff about New York, but it was uh, about what the New York art scene was like in the 80s. And that was like just before we were coming up, you know, we were coming up in the 90s. And um, the political engagement on the ground among artists was really remarkable, uh, especially with ACT UP, but also um, with work with the stuff that was going on in Latin America. There, And I remember that from when I was an undergrad, that that was like a really, it was a major issue for people, you know? Um, and it was sort of, I don't know, it was a bit disheartening because it just was really nice to think of artists like as a seriously activist group. And I feel like our relation to, relationship to direct action is very minimal. We, we are not on the ground people. We have not been, I'm not opposed, but I seem to never get myself there. No, um, we are not joiners. That's our problem. You know, like I really, I feel, uh, I wish that I were a joiner. It would allow me to do more direct action, but you know, I already have to do a lot of emails. And I know that that kind of direct action work requires many emails. I just, I don't, I don't, 
I don't have the bandwidth. It's the same as not being able to work with someone to perform. Um, my activism, which is fucking hardcore, actually, is in the classroom and is in uh, meetings, which is why I am having disciplinary action brought against me right now. Um, and uh, and in other parts of my lived experience, you know, like when I go and buy weed and I ask the guy, um, Oh my God, you ever, have you ever known a, a woman who's in menopause? It's crazy. And he was like, yeah, actually my mother-in-law is in menopause. Her marriage broke up. <laughs> and this is this awesome guy that I love who is like, last night I went in and he was wearing, he's like a big kind of lumbering, very slow guy. And he was wearing like a money bag, diamond thing around his neck and also like four other ones and he has big gold rings but he's super sweet and told me about the menopause oh he has a teardrop how to too i love buying weed and i have to stop i love going to the the smoke shops where you can buy it there's always these really interesting young men always yeah. oh yeah the town and one, you know, final question, which is wondering how you guys feel about Nan Bowman and her, uh, you know, her treatment of narrative. You thought it was a touchstone or a rebellion for you guys. And then, you know, her current uh, return to the spotlight through this kind of like um, targeting of the Sacklers. I we, can. We have not seen the film. The um, new film. No, I wish we could actually. The my general feeling about that and about a lot of activism that is in the art world that is kind of about the art world like that um, is that I don't really care. Um, like that level, the, the level that the Sacklers are working at in the art world is fucked, and it's going to stay fucked. It's not going to change by people saying you should change. I don't. I just and yeah, those kind of things i don't see i don't see art in those at that level of institutional control being something that i'm like really enthusiastic about and worried about if it goes away i like, love I, the hit i love nan golden and i oh think yeah, she's well, awesome yeah. she's, and she's amazing of course yeah actually, no her activism is fantastic I but the, sorry i'm yelling in your ear um i do think that the activism that she did against the cyclers did have an effect you know i do i think that it really you know she's a fairly high profile person even in the kind of broader world not very but a bit and um the Dians were like smart and strategic and uh, i think it's really reasonable to think um fuck this I am an artist in the world and I have to go in a building that's named after the people who killed people I adore. <laughs> you know, I think I feel like that in a certain way is like it's local activism. It's just that she lives in the art. <laughs> I and I also, you know, she is an artist who has made insistently femme work. And, you know, I feel like one of the only ways that femme work gets shown is uh, if it's um, about the ravages of trauma. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's interesting that the first time trauma has even come up, I think, in this conversation. I mean, it seems so central, um, particularly in terms of I mean, the narrative and trauma um, seems very alive in your work. Um, but, it, you know, it's funny, we, by default, you know, and in some sense, I mean, I, I sort of agree with you, Kibber, in terms of, I mean, yeah, I could change, you know, I mean, there's things that are so big and so powerful and so sick, but what's the point? But by, by de facto, you know, by situating ourselves here where we are, and I would never call myself an activist, but I've sort of become one in the sense of just like, you must care for those around you. And then you come into contact with them because of where you root yourself and then, you just do it, you know? I mean, people come now to get some cannibal and say, I'm going to make it a bit and I need food for my cats. You know, and it's like, I don't know exactly how you found this, but let's do it if we can. Um, 
But I find that inspiring. I find it inspiring that you can just... Well, we don't do a lot of, like, artist activism. No. Um, we have hosted some of that that comes from the community, but we don't really put that forward in that way. And um, Shy away from it. Yeah. But, I, you know, I think the trauma question is so interesting. Actually, for one of my classes, I'm reading some of keto, keto sterile? How do you say sterile. her name? Sterile. Sterile. Like sterile, except for sh- sterile. Keto, keto sterile. I've had to practice it and practice it. <laughs> sterile. Sterile. Her children. Yeah. But actually, you, your work reminds me a lot about her approach, and she has this great line about how the trauma floor closes, um, prevents people from connecting. It's also their their barrier to connecting, and I don't find that to be... I find you to be, um, again, really able to take something that, that in other people's hands ends up being this kind of foreclosure and instead of opening up, really empathically connecting to people. So, well, this is maybe our sort of last question. I'll just have to check on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, in some ways, I admire that you take on very clearly anti white supremacy, anti carceral, and these things. And in some ways, we shy away from that. It's obviously implicit in everything we do, but I think sometimes we react to how it's being reified. You know, yes. like people look at it, they're still across when they say this. You know, I mean, I mentioned land acknowledgments earlier, and I always picture the university president Googling what time lived here before they do it. And <laughs> I really like her. Right? So, performative politics is basically what you're asking about. And uh, I guess I, have, I just have like my, my quick, quick answer to uh, the idea of performative politics in general, which I don't think is what you're asking specifically here, is that all politics are performative. They're social. It's social action, you know, to expect people's politics to not be when they're expressed performative is ridiculous and actually causes people a shitload of pain, you know, like, um, uh, There are many of us who are just like fucking up and sorry <laughs> and like trying to uh, express it, trying to, you know, if you know better, do better. And like, um, yeah, I don't know why I started saying that. Oh, because the politics thing, um, the, the reason that that stuff is in there um, is actually because of the research. like. Mm-hmm. It after I started to do the research, I was like, okay, there is no way that we can go forward with this project at all if we aren't completely like, um, if we don't uh, allow people to understand, you know, just allow people to to know that, like in the U.S. and in Canada, um, the first law of prohibition was actually, I don't know if it's in the U.S. now, I want to backtrack, but definitely in Canada, the first uh, prohibition law prohibited Indigenous people only from entering places where alcohol was served. So, like, it's just, you know, uh, um, drug prohibition laws were racist from their inception uh, and are racist now. Well, that makes me... I mean, there's a story that our dear friend Juan Clark, who wrote for this, uh, these writings that go along with the show, told us about how his ancestors came to Louisiana, and it was because of the prohibition on salt. And so that's actually what I was thinking about when you, you know, the salt is indeed a drug, right? <laughs> like it's a, it's, it enhances flavor, it changes an experience. So and that was a kind of, um, connection that I was thinking about, the way that prohibition has like shaped and moved these people. And they were specifically interested in these salt smugglers because they could navigate these um, waterways, which were similar to the waterways here in Louisiana. So they were, you know, really penalizing these people because they were so useful here. Um, Yeah. Yeah. We currently have a prohibition that passed last year here in Baton Rouge for you know, essentially you can be arrested, the cops stop you and your homeless, you don't have an address, you know, which is just straight back to the Code of Arm. Um, so in some ways, there's such a visceral, like being here in Louisiana as a non-native, there's just such a visceral, you know, repulsion when you 
realize this. I mean, plus we just stopped having Angola prison labor during COVID. Um, but I mean, when we first arrived here, I mean, you could literally just walk around campus. You know, they're prisoners cleaning the grounds. You know, this university built on top of plantation grades. And so I think maybe that's from the wilderness. Shit, that is just like. That's, yeah, that's a an incredible piece uh, uh, I will be shocked to witness in person. I shot, come okay. there in a few months. You know what we will be? We will be shocked and sort of like fascinated and like, and that's not how, um, that's a different relationship to it. You know, it's, it's like trauma as spectacle. And uh, I'm not saying at all that that's like a sin or unforgivable because we all, uh, we, you know, it's rubbernecking. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's. Well, we hope you guys are going to come visit us. Uh, we really okay. want to mark. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to come in March. It's going to be awesome. I'm super excited so that we can be titillated by all of the uh, spectacles of trauma. <laughs> oh, God. That doesn't sound good at all, does it? Oh, sorry. That was great. We will get the video up. Um, and we thank anybody who knew. Uh, we're so sorry. These things are always happening in every aspect of this crazy landscape down. The last minute, there's one thing with sound or whatever it is. But we'll get the video up of the interview and uh, um, we'll post it on YouTube without films. And uh, we'll talk more. But again, we just want you to know that your work, for me at least, your work has been the most exciting work I discovered this year. And uh, we actually are editing a film we made right now, and it's your big inspiration to us, and sort of looking at how you, just how you work. You know, we're taking a lot of, uh, what are we doing? A lot of inspiration. It's another we're word. Taking notes. We're taking notes. Don't don't sue us if we're too similar. <laughs> you know, I, I, what one thing that I that we do that I've we've done from the beginning is there's kind of a lot of filmmaking common sense rules that exist that we don't go by. Like one of the first ones being this, like this idea that if you're going to have something that's complicated, like we're trying to do sound and image should always be working on the text should be about one thing, the visuals should be about something else. And we, from the very beginning have been like, no, if we want to make a point, we want people to like get it. So we're going to like put a picture of the dog when we say dog. Like yeah. obviously, <laughs> we're gonna like illustrate every point of a of a piece of text with a visual that's like a one for one relationship. I think that in uh the 90s, uh our era, <laughs> as we have learned, um, I think that you know the turn to pop um in art was very useful for us and allowed us different narrative arcs that are shorter, you know, being like, just like a meme, a meme is like a meme is not part of our experience, but that's like the the kind of, um, each act that becomes available. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I, um, again, don't remember why I started saying that, but, uh, it was super interesting. Thank you guys for having us. Yeah. Oh, obviously. I just want to one more time quickly come back to that because from the very beginning, I think one of the things we most had in common as artists was being super irritated by this art, that conceptual art that we were seeing that was impenetrable and was like, this is a representation of this that I've done through this, or this is an ex, uh, um, I'm, I'm, doing an exploration of gray, you know, um, and we just totally repudiated that. And we wanted the work to be fucking clear and to make somebody feel something. And, uh, but we also knew, and this is like something that I really impart to students a lot. Okay. You've got the part that's like kind of formulaic. So now you need to just go in there and fuck it up, you know? You make some li- like, and sometimes it feels stupidly strategic, but it also feels like if there's anything that is at the fundament of my thinking, it is that uh, things are all mixed up, you know.